What's up, squadron? Aviation has given me a ton of amazing experiences. Good, good job there. Nice rock, high wing. <laughs> but more importantly, it's introduced me to a whole new family of friends. Like, dude, you're killing it. You're having a great day. I just never give up. Airport, and then, oh, by the way, I got car ice while I was flying through, so the engine started running rough. I had to Join us tonight as we're clear direct for some hangar flying. I am Ryan Dabrowski, and this is Super Aero Live. I was alive. I don't know. I've been alive. Okay. What's up, Av Geeks? It's Wednesday, which can only mean one thing. After last week, I'm looking at the audio meter with frightened. I'm frightened about the audio meter because all the problems we had last week. Anyway. It can only mean one thing. It's time for another episode of Super Aero Live. I hope you're all having an awesome week in Airplaneville. Uh, I had a... I'm still tired. I was in, in Gainesville, Texas for the national finals of National Stoll, providing uh, someone actually called me the voice of National Stoll, and I was very flattered and, and honored to be called that. And uh, you should make sure to go check out that, that live stream of the finals. Not... Maybe a surprise to anybody, but Steve Henry coming out on top in uh, his uh, crazy Highlander thing. It was like no wind that day, so we didn't get some like really insane numbers. But the thing's basically a helicopter. It was super, super intense. And the other thing to check out is if you're following the sport, uh, the without spoiling it too much, there was a bit of an up, bit of an upset in light touring in the light touring class nationally. That was uh, that was cool to see. So anyway, check that out. Uh, they, they, we did have a, one airplane up on its nose during the, the qualifying, which is, you know, happens sometimes with the stole stuff, and it was, it was fine, but it was a little exciting. It looked expensive. So, anyway, uh, worth a check out. And again, thanks to the National Stole guys for bringing me on, uh, guys and gals, for bringing me on to help tell their story this, this year. Uh, such a cool group of people to meet and such a cool thing to do. So, say hi to a couple of you in the chat real quick. Zach Sherman, James Hyatt, the, the, the Sky Fam is all here. Jonathan Christman's here. 72 Papa's here. If we've got, you know, uh, unique airplanes, he's always here for sure. Jason Follis is here. Waukesha Pilot's here. And I'd like to point out, we started like 10 seconds early, and the software actually was like, are you sure? Are you sure, Ryan? You want to start early? Who else is here? Ryan Krieger is here. Uh, man. The, oh, Marty's here. Scrolling, scrolling. Rico is here. Red Baron Modeling Team. James Clark is here. Scarface. I like seeing your name every week, Scarface, because uh, it just makes me think of, of simpler times. Gary Smith's here. Dude, the gang is all here. What's up, Jonathan? Good to see you. Uh, we got to talk. Oh, Mike's here, of course, from New Zealand. He's also watching. He's got a lot of water. How's that for a transition? I want to introduce you guys to somebody uh, we just met a few minutes ago on the on the video call, but check it out. It's Alex Rolinski. What's up, Alex? Hey, how's it going, guys? So, Alex, you and I have been chatting a little bit about, I mean, we're going to talk about seaplanes tonight. There's one on your shirt. Spoiler hey. alert. Ugh, can't really get it in the camera. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Brad's in the chat. What's up, Brad? So, Alex, I mean, I guess we're going to... I'm going to... Here, let me load it up here. Like, we're going to talk about this this amazing adventure, no pun intended, uh, tonight, and how folks at home can have this sort of thing happening in their real life. Like, you were like, that's my boat and my drone and everything. So that's really super cool. But I want to go back... I want to start with, like, the the we always talk about on this show like the origin story so i'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about uh the alex origin story in terms of of aviation and how you got involved in aviation yeah so um great question obviously uh <laughs> always an interesting story i think everybody who comes to aviation has a really really interesting background of how they got here um mine is probably similar to a lot of them in regards to my father was a private pilot and he was flying a Cessna 150 when I was born. So I got taken up quite a bit in the, uh, in the Cessna and got kind of, since I was, I guess as far back as I can remember, I was exposed to the airplanes and he started getting into the experimental world 
um, and building kits. Uh, so he, he started doing a long easy uh, when I was probably about seven or eight. And then he got into building an Avid Flyer, um, built one of those um, all through about 13, 14 is when he finally sold that. I got really big into model airplanes, being young and not being able to reach the rudder pedal. So I started flying what I could. <laughs> um, Love that, you know, really learned about aerodynamics and experimenting there as well. So I was always into the into the tinkering, building, experimenting, and flying, obviously. So after that, uh, just a kind of lost touch with, with the experimental aviation side, went into um, the military. I was in uh, Army aviation and ended up getting to, getting to work and fly on helicopters for quite some time. Oh, that's um, dope. Yeah, yeah, it was it actually that was probably some of the I would have done that job for free if they had in the civilian world. It was one of the funnest times I've ever had. Um, got a lot of experience on turbines and uh, and you know large hydraulic systems and just cool stuff. Uh, came out of that and um, had an opportunity to get involved in this company. I, I actually had bought um, an Aventura single seater, and uh, I just once I started flying that and realizing that it was no more you know confines of going from an airport to another airport or that hundred dollar hamburger, you could really just go anywhere. It, it opened up a whole new world for me. And I just, uh, I had the opportunity to purchase the company and I dove headfirst into it and I've been doing it ever since. It was kind of like an addiction. (laughs) Man, there's so many things we could talk about right there. Like we could, I feel we could spend a whole hour talking about work, helicopter, military aviation. I don't think we've even talked about helicopters on this show yet. Have we? I don't know, guys. Let me know in the chat if we've ever... I can't remember if we talked about helicopters. So, that's a pretty... I mean, I love that... I mean, maybe this is, was obvious to you, but the idea of, like, well, you know, we had home building in our blood, and now you're, like, in this aircraft company. Like, that feels... Does it feel pretty natural to you to have that connection? You know, it's funny because looking back on it, my... My dad was really into the building aspect of things, and I was just, you know, more of a kid. It was, it was kind of like, oh, that's cool, but I really didn't get involved in the, in the wrench turning and the hands-on process. And looking back on it, especially with what I do now, it's crazy how, you know, they're just, it's all the same, and, and I can feel the same passion my father had back then for what he was doing. And and I wish, obviously, hindsight's twenty twenty. I could have really jumped on board then. It would have made, um, you know, a lot of my learning curve a lot easier later on in life. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very similar. I mean, it, you, it's just, uh, it's been an overall awesome experience. So talk to me a little bit about, I mean, let, I think maybe the next thing, place way to go with it would be wondering, and by the way, everyone in the chat, if you have questions uh, for Alex, or about the aircraft, like definitely drop them in the chat. We, we will ask them here. But the one of the things that I'm wondering about, if maybe you could tee up for us as we like work our way up through this, is uh, sea like seaplane flying is like very like you know I'm a private pilot, uh, you know do a little bit of off like very tiny bit of off airport stuff or like grass runway stuff we don't it's wisconsin right like we don't get we don't get to explore that much beyond like you know everyone's grabbing their one wheels or whatever but uh what's it like what's the seaplane experience because you're you're down in florida right that is correct yeah i I do live in florida and then obviously the the landscape here is just seaplane like heaven because there's so many places so many lakes so many rivers bays etc um there's really and i tell people this you know there's not many places i can't land from a thousand feet in florida so if my engine quits or anything goes wrong uh with an aircraft like this you really can go anywhere so it, it adds a safety component but as well as just the, the exploration aspect as well if i wanted to get i mean i guess let's talk about the aventura right like Mm-hmm. That's why we're all here tonight. This is, I mean, you sent some beautiful photography here. Like, this is what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it really kind of redefines the freedom aspect. I don't want to sound cheesy, but um, having flown, you know, I had, I had 42 hours in a 172 uh, when I finally completed my license. And the um, that, to me, was was all there was back then. And I started in high school. I actually flew around in, in Nogales, right on the border, Arizona, beautiful sunsets, you know, great, great weather. You get a lot of thermals. Um, I experimented with some glider flying in Germany, but for the most part, my experience, my, my um, experience was fair. It was fairly narrow. And I didn't realize it at the time, you know, I was thinking like anybody else, I'm, I'm a pilot. I can, I do cool stuff. And then getting into this, 
we we sell airplanes to i mean for for requirement wise i mean you can have a sport license and fly this aircraft so we have a lot of people that get into it for the sport aspect um some of them don't even go through the full private and we have others that are retiring out of the airlines and want to get into this for fun um but something like this really just opens up your horizons in terms of what you do with an airplane and and what you probably didn't really conceive as being possible before It, it really makes those out of reach places obtainable um and yeah, if, if you look at some of these pictures, you can see that a lot of this is, is just kind of like, you know, living a dream. None of this is Photoshopped. It's all real. A lot of these pictures are actually based in uh, around the Keys, Florida, as well as um, Puerto Rico. Uh, we have them all over the world. Uh, and so it's really, you know, we, we even have it up in Canada where you wouldn't really think um, there's snow and everything else. So, you know, why would you need a seaplane? But they can land on the snow as well. So it's, it's crazy, the versatility of a machine like this. So Brad in the chat is wondering if you could talk a little bit about how easy is it to transition from single engine land to single engine sea? Like if you're already like, you know, got your wings already, like how do I get my, I was going to try to come up with that. That was a joke fail. Like, how do you get your flippers? I don't know. I tried. Right. <laughs> but how do you, no, how, you right. how was that transition like? How do you, how do you do that? So, yeah, and I'm going to I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not not trying to discourage anybody. I just want to say there is there it is a lot different um, coming from a 172 tricycle gear tractor configuration, um, you know, a great glide ratio, uh, landomatic gear. You can drop it in from 15 feet. You're not going to do any anything wrong. Whereas you're going into this, which is a, a pusher, high thrust line. Uh, the thrust is behind the center of gravity, has a tendency to want to veer off when you're takeoff versus landing. It's a tail dragger. It has no shock, so you, you really got to fly it on. You know, um, and of course, water doesn't compress, so um, can't drop it in from 15 feet on that. There are a lot of differences. It's, a, it's considered a high lift, high drag airplane. Um, but transition wise, it's actually fairly easy. A lot of our customers find themselves getting getting fairly uh, proficient at it within about 10 to 15 hours. I know a lot of airplanes can take about five. Uh, this one tends to be about 10 to 15, but after that, they, they start to go out on their own and they're practicing. They become proficient to be able to solo and stuff in it or feel comfortable enough to do it by themselves. And then, of course, all that experience gains pretty rapidly by you just going out and doing it. Um, so we, we show you the, the techniques uh, and tips and tricks, if you will, of how to fly an aircraft like this. But in reality, it's it's not that difficult. It's just very different from what people um, are used to flying. So if you come to us with no bad habits, in other words, you're a low time sport pilot, you might adapt quicker than somebody who's been flying for 30 years in, in a single type of airplane. So, um, you know, that that experience is is important, but also sometimes can be harmful. So we, we just we tell people, you know, start from with an open mind and uh, you end up loving it. It's just it's a little different, but you get a hold of it. So along those lines, one of the things that I was wondering about is because you hear about like, you know, up here in Wisconsin, it's it's about to get horribly cold. And one of the mm-hmm. things that we all fantasize about up here is like popping down to like Jack Brown seaplane base, getting our ratings. It's maybe a little different experience. But when I was thinking about that, as you were talking about the transition, I was also thinking about the difference between, I wonder if you could talk about the difference between like a float plane. Like I think about like, you know, or up in Wisconsin, it's a lot of aircraft on floats compared to like yeah. a seaplane proper. What's what's the difference in that? I mean, obviously, there's the physical difference, but what's the difference right, in right. performance or, or flight experience? Well, you bring up a great point. Um, I, I honestly don't discount the seaplane rating itself. I think everybody should go and do it, regardless of what kind of plane you want to fly. The the limitations there is a lot of places. And, and now Florida, I would say, is one of the quickest ones to adapt. Um, and, and I'm hoping a lot of places elsewhere do as well. But they've gotten very diverse in the aircraft that you can train on. So... Some of them have amphib type hulls now. It's not just like a, a J3 Cub on floats um, anymore. So, but nonetheless, that's still great experience because water, confined takeoff uh, training, glassy water landings, all of those are, are the same um, in both aircraft. And then the difference is really are you know the float plane. You're taking an aircraft and you're throwing floats on it. So it's a game of give and take. You're you're taken away from the from the performance and aspect of now it's going to be slower. It's more draggy. You got to carry a bigger engine. You lost some of your useful load. Etc. And you know you're carrying those floats whether you're using them or not. Whereas a lot of these amphibs are designed to fly this way. They were they were designed around this whole concept. So it's it's no longer yes. Of course we don't go 150 knot cruise or anything, but um, it's a it's a very uh, well well rounded 
uh, machine for its capabilities. So some of the differences on that are the fact that, you know, with the floats, they usually take off a, a little slower in, in reference to they have, um, they take a longer takeoff run. So some of them can even take 2000 feet to get off a lake. So you're kind of limited on, on tight lakes or small lakes and, and so on. Uh, whereas these amphibs tend to be, especially the light sport ones, they're, they're very quick off the water. Um, I've gotten off the water, in fact, in, in one of our previous S17 models, uh, six seconds. So you cool. don't really have time to even talk through that, right? So I tried to do a video where it was like, okay, here you put on the throttle, here we hold the stick one inch after neutral. But by the time I was even getting that out, I was already flying. So it was it was a mute point. So a lot of these, like I said, are, are kind of a stole, as you mentioned earlier, being out there, a stole type setup for, for water. Um, so those are the main differences, I would say. Uh, we can we can carry quite a bit. Um, we can also perform very well on the water because it was designed to do that from the get go. More like more boat like. Yeah, exactly. So we're we're a boat and an airplane. Um, there is a there, there's physics to this where to be a good good boat, um, a good driving uh, vessel, I guess if you want to call it that, because you still have to taxi and land and drive on the ground, um, and then to be able to fly well. All of that has to be designed right from the get go. And I think that's one of the, th the features I highlight about our aircraft is, you know, that engineering was there from the beginning. So we were able to piggyback off of an existing model that we knew all of the downsides to. Um, and then they redesigned all of that out of it using physics and math and all of that. And uh, I won't get into the, to the nerdy details, but basically made it to where, you know, as a, as a plane that's a tail dragger, but a land plane, um, doesn't isn't tail heavy it's very well balanced you can do a three-point landing you can do a wheel landing it doesn't matter it's very docile it's in, in fact it's probably the most docile uh tail wheel i've ever flown and i used to have a kit fox 4 1200 that was a freaking handful on grove gear on the, on the ground <laughs> whereas this is extremely i mean this is a joke I, I i call myself a tail wheel pilot but in reality the last 600 hours i've been flying this tail wheel um it's it's been <laughs> it's been kind of cheating um and then as an airplane it's extremely stable we have a lot of we have really good dihedral in um so you can basically you fly hands off in fact i did a demo flight two days ago um with a customer steve and we went up and i flew for 10 minutes with my feet on the floor and my hands in my lap not touching anything and this is no joke it's not a sales pitch um and i have no autopilot and that was at 1200 feet now granted it was about nine in the morning uh so thermals weren't too bad we were flying over water but for the most part the plane's just super stable and then uh, on the water, same thing. You know, our hull was designed very well. We've had the same hull since 1995, so over 25 years, uh, and not needed to change anything with it. The steps in a perfect location for the center of gravity. So the transition from being a plane to the boat, you don't have the porpoise aspects. I mean, all of this just just lends itself to making the flying a lot more fun. I'm just looking at the like this photo is like that looks like a party. Um, <laughs> so. Okay, there's a lot of different ways I could go. First of all, I got to say thank you to James Clark. I think that was an accident, but thank you. And Jonathan Chrisman, thanks so much, buddy. It has been a few weeks. It's good to have you back on the live. Thank you guys for the super chat, super sticker thing that helps keep the things going over here. Uh, people are joking slash wanted to ask you questions about the power plant. Brad says, is there a single power plant for these or are there variances in engine size or horsepower? And then 72 Papa says, oh, it's got a Mercruiser, which is a, that's a fun, funny joke. Yeah, uh, well, you guys funny, know anything funny, about tidbit your boats. About that. Go funny ahead. tidbit about that is I actually wanted to run a Mercruiser or, uh, you know, Yamaha, whatever it was, cowling from an outboard motor on our aero momentums, which is an automotive conversion. So ironically, I was going to do that as kind of a joke, make the cow look like an outboard motor. Uh, for when we fly around, I think that'd be hilarious, but never got around to it yet. Um, I might eventually, unfortunately, those cows are very heavy. So we, being an aircraft, tend to try to keep things light, try to have to make a mold and produce it. And uh, unless it was a, a viable product to sell, I don't think I'd, I'd want to re invest the resources into it as a joke, but um, it was kind of funny. So, um, yes, we have to answer your, the, the question about the power plants. We have experimented with, I wanna say over nine different engines on the same platform. Remember, I, I come from that experimental world where I really like to gather data and, and play with these things to find out what the best fit is. And we've narrowed our, our kind of what we offer in terms of power plants down to three. Um, but we've flown everything from a Lycoming 235, uh, half V-dub engines, HKSs, Rotax, all the Rotax 9 series, uh, that all the way down to the, well, we make single suiters as well. So we've done everything from a 277, all the two strokes that pretty much are no longer offered 
uh, by Rotex. And then we've also done automotive conversions, which a lot of people kind of, uh, you see a lot of that going that way. So you have the, the Yamaha Apex, which we have not tested yet, uh, but we've done the air momentum, uh, 117, 147, and the 100 horsepower. And then the Vikings, we've run the Viking 110, the 130. Um, what was the other one? Uh, we have not tested the 90 yet. I was interested in doing that, but unfortunately I think Jan took a different direction with it. Um, so we, we've flown quite a few different engines on these aircraft. And right now, as our SLSA, which is our certified version, we do offer the 912 series. So you can go all, all the way up to a 915, although that's not certified yet. We don't have one flying, but that is an option from a mounting perspective. So we have the 912, 912 IS, um, and then, of course, the 914 that you can get. And then with the automotive conversions, right now it, it's really a toss-up between the air momentum or Viking, whichever you prefer. We, we have a lot more air momentums flying, and that's just because of the single overhead cam and, and the pressed oil pan. It makes it for a much lighter engine um, that pushes plenty of power. So it's some of our most high-performing aircraft are, are done with the air, mo- air momentum. That, that brings up an interesting question, I guess. And you meant, you hinted at this earlier, but I'm curious about performance in terms of you know, I guess when I, when I look at it, and the reason uh, we were talking before the show started, I was saying, oh, you know, my dad used to have a house in Florida, and and uh, we were joking a lot about, well, joking maybe isn't the right word, fantasizing is maybe more accurate, yeah. about getting a, a seaplane, uh, specifically, not a, not a float plane type thing, and then talking about, you know, hey, look at the Aventura. I was sending him the the single seat version, like, Hey, like, you're not going to ride with me anyway, pops. Like, why don't you go in the boat and then I'll like, just, you know, do orbits around you as you, as we go. Um, but like the, you know, the performance side of it, I guess is something I'm curious about. Like what's the type of speed ranges weights. I don't know. We can get into the nerdy stuff now if you want to. Sure. Yeah, no problem. And in fact, uh, that does vary drastically based on the engine package you, you pick. Um, so, like I said, I have a lot of data on the Rotax series. Um, the Rotax gives us the best power to weight ratio. So, um, in other words, the 100 horsepower and on up. The 912 IS, I'm not a big fan of just because it does add extra installation weight for us. And it, it does run hotter, which when you're when you're trolling on the ground or in, on the water, um, you don't get a lot of air through your radiator. So, you, you tend to... You tend to want an engine that's not going to overheat, and the IS runs a little hotter for my liking. So, and then of course it derates the power when you go to take off, et cetera, et cetera. So the 914 and 912 tend to give us the best bang for our buck. Um, however, the air momentum gives us the most amount of thrust. Uh, it, it exceeds the Rotax by about 200. Um, so uh, that that's quite a bit um, <laughs> in comparison. We're about four to 600 with the air momentum 600. The Rotax was about 400 pounds of thrust. So um, the air momentum will get off the water a lot quicker. Uh, it, with Even with two people, full fuel, we get a little bit better climb and performance overall. It does take away from the useful load because it's about 50 pounds heavier than the Rotax, uh, just to give you that those numbers. So it really depends on your mission, what you're looking to do. If you're looking to go you know, cross-country with it, it's, it's probably a slower option for cross-country machines, but we can carry quite a bit. And uh, I mean, it's obviously fun to fly. So if you decide that you want to make longer trips or you live further away from the lake, the Rotex is probably going to be your better option because you can carry more stuff. Um, the air momentum, if you're going out and wanting to have fun or you live on a lake or, you know, you, you have, like we do in Florida, uh, pretty much water in your backyard, um, the air momentum is probably your best suited uh, just because it's easy to work on. It's very cost effective to maintain and uh, you just you gun that throttle and it goes. Takeoff wise, I mean, all of them, like I mentioned before, with the light, light sports side is fairly stole capable. So on the ground, I mean, you're off in 300 feet. On the water, you're often under 500. Um, the Rotex 100 horsepower just depends how much weight you got because that's probably the least amount of thrust to power, but best power to weight. So um, they're light, but they also, if you load them up, they can they can bog down. So the air momentum offsets that a little bit with that extra thrust. Um, let's see what else. Landing distances, uh, they're pretty much identical. Um, the cruise speeds, to answer that, most of our aircraft cruise about 75 to 80 miles an hour. Um, the heavier ones that we produce now. And I say heavier, it's because we have so many different options that we've come out with. The, the Aventura has evolved a lot and I don't want to turn this into a sales pitch, but I get excited no. about it. Um, we've, we've added, you know, now we have our, our, I call it like a luxury type interior and people buy on aesthetics. So we've added a lot of stuff to give it the finishing touches. Um, so it's really comfort, uh, comfort minded. It, we do full paint jobs now. So it's, it's not just clear coated Dacron like you see in a lot of the pictures. Um, 
these aircraft are hardly distinguishable between, you know, a lot of these aircraft out on that you would see on a flight line now with what we've done improvement wise. So some of the heavier ones that we cruise, I do about, I was doing 90 miles an hour with Steve out to the lake, uh, but comfortably you're doing about 83 to uh, 85 miles an hour. Um, and that's at about 5,400 RPM. And now remember these are geared engines. So with it being geared, you know, we're not talking the 2,500, 2,700 RPM, like the light combing, which we do have, I mentioned before, direct drive light combing, uh, 235 on one of these. This one, they tend to run around, you know, 5,500, 5,800 on takeoff. And then cruise is about 40, anywhere from 48 to 5,000. Um, and then you can obviously go, go lower if you, if you want to start descending. <laughs> no, that's awesome. And I, I, I was going to bring up actually that like fit and finish thing. Uh, you know, I've seen that some of the stuff and that's, that's always the trade off you make, right. Is like the more car like it looks, the heavier it get it gets. Right. So then it's that comfort versus useful load thing. What, yeah. what is the, someone was asking in here, what, what's the average useful load range? I know it's, you've got a couple different models, but like, sure. Yeah, so with the two seaters, I mean, it ranges from about five thirty to six hundred pounds. Um, that's that's. In fact, I don't think we have any that we've made, and we've we, we've made two very heavy Aventuras, as I call them, that, um, and none of them were under five hundred pounds useful load. So with the ANSYS data that that we collected and the loading data that we did for the our SLSA process, we learned a lot about the airplane. Even though it's been around since nineteen ninety five, a lot of this these tests were not done because uh, they weren't required. So what, when we went through it, we learned even like how crazy strong the airplane really is, which we we had an idea. But when you see all of those sandbags piled on there, I mean, basically, we had like two Chevy trucks parked on our wings. It was it was intense and and it, and it withstood it, you know, and then you take them off and it goes right back to the shape it was. It, it's crazy. So that was exciting. Um, so the aircraft can actually handle somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1,600 pounds and 135 mile per hour V and E. Now we quote 105 because we know somebody's going to push that limit and we don't want them killing themselves. And then the other part of that is, uh, you know, the 1430 is the LSA weight limit. So we're even at 1430, the aircraft aircraft performs very well. And we're about 150 to 200 pounds lighter um, than our competition. And a lot of that is because of so much triangulation we have in our structure and, and the way the aircraft's built. So ultimately they start off very light. So adding all of this stuff, even when you're done with every option you can throw on it, and I have one now that, that is our demo plane that has every option we offer on it. So I'm carrying around a 28 to 30 pound uh, Magnum parachute on it that I'll probably never use in Florida because I don't go pretty much above 1500 feet. Um, but I'm carrying that around to showcase, you know, all these different options. So that's one of them. I have a heater, right? We're in Florida. Why, why would I need a heater? But I have a heater. Um, I, I have flares. One. I got, I, yeah, I, I have 23 that. gallon fuel tank. I got the, the full interior. I got tow brakes. Um, you, you name it. We put it in here, full G3X panel. And uh, so it's probably one of the heaviest aventures we have. And it's, it's just, just over a uh, thousand pounds. So it's like a thousand twenty empty. So, with that, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the heaviest one ever made, but that would be like you have to order everything we have and stuff it on the plane and go fly that way. Whereas, like I said, um, that's not common. So uh, 99% of our aircraft flying are well under 1,000 pounds, and that really gives us that, um, that performance as well as the useful load. There was a question that came up about the gear... The landing mm -hmm. gear. And thank you, by the way, for that rundown. I love the nerdy stuff. Chelsea Smith says, uh, this is basically like my 150 with the gear sawed off, which would maybe float. She, she says it'd float. I don't know if it would float. She knows better than I would. She's, yeah, like, <laughs> she's like a warbird mechanic. Uh, all right. So, so I'm trying to find a picture of, see if we have anything with the gear. You can kind of see him in this photo kind of under the... Yeah, uh, so I, I didn't the showcase there. the gear. I was more showcasing the lifestyle, I guess, with the pictures. But <laughs> no, that's, that's a good question. The gear is, is very simple. Um, it, it goes into what's called a bulkhead assembly, which is basically a big rectangular structure. And it's where everything from the triangulation aspect meets. And the gear legs are come out of that, which which supports the entire aircraft. And the gear legs are 4130 chromoly steel that's heat treated. So it does have almost acts like kind of a leaf spring uh, when you land hard on it. Um, they're not really designed to take maximum weight drop from 15 feet 
but we did do our drop test at 21 inches and with two with fully loaded meaning 14 30 pounds and and they don't they don't bend so that was a that was a great part but they are rigid and in other words the only shock absorbency is with that that springiness in the metal so the heat treat process really aids in that um the gear wrote pivots uh for lack of better words that and it goes from being in the down position as you see on that airplane there that drove up to the on the shore uh and then it goes right up under the strut so repositions it's not technically considered retractable it's repositionable and it, and the reason I say that also is because it doesn't add anything for performance. So if you're not leaving the pattern, we tell people don't raise your gear because uh, there's just one last thing to remember. But if you do leave the pattern, we raise the gear as a safety concern so you don't forget when you go land in water. So the gear is very simple. It just moves up and down, and that's pretty much it. It doesn't rotate, anything like that. So kind of like the for uh, – who is it? James – like this is here in the down position, you can kind of see, mm -hmm. and then I think this photo might be a good example. You can kind of see in the green and yellow aircraft, like they're kind yeah, of like- You're gonna see it right next to the hole there under the strut. It comes up to, normally when we rig them, they're about one inch below the strut. Um, and that's, if you run a 800 uh, size tire, it would be partially touching the strut. Um, anything bigger than that, you're gonna start to, to run out of room <laughs> clearance wise to be able to get it out of the way for the water. So the Chelsea says people will be dropping them in much higher than 21 inches. Haven't you seen these people? <laughs> yeah, no, that was, that was what was the requirement for the ASTM standards. But uh, yeah, no, we, we've actually, I've, I've had, in fact, students uh, drop the airplane from quite a distance. <laughs> um, and, a lot of times, you know, they'll bend a, uh, a spindle or they, they even bend the, the spindle housing, but all that's replaceable. With, and that's the nice thing about this aircraft. It's so cost effective. The parts themselves are very simple, very cheap um, to manufacture and sell. So just a, a simple bolt on and go. You're back in the air in no time. So it, it, is, it is a very stout airplane. Are you guys still, I mean, obviously the two seat market, you know, there's a there's a handful of competitors in the in the two seat market. Are you still selling a fair amount of the single seat? Like, is it is it actually an ultralight the single seat one or? Yeah. So just to give you a little bit of a back, yeah, the the two seats are are kind of bread and butter, and the reason for that is because we are we are the most cost effective kit out there, both SLSA as well as a kit. So nobody can beat our prices. In fact, our nearest competitor just raised their prices, so they're almost twenty thousand dollars more than our our aircraft uh, start tech. And I just recently did a video that should be coming out shortly, uh, comparing the two. And and really, down to down to it, it was just a sixty to ninety thousand dollar difference. So you know, it was hard to justify spending the extra money and getting nothing for it. So I think that video is gonna gonna stir the pot, but um, that's okay. Uh, the so the two seater market is is kind of our bread and butter. But yes, we've actually gotten in the last couple of years a, a huge influx of interest in our single seaters uh, we offered for for quite a few years we've offered two different single seat versions one was considered an hp which is high performance and that just meant you're not in the ul category part 103 doesn't apply you can put the biggest engine you want do whatever you want with it but it's just one seat so it's half the size of an aventura 2. Um, then we have the ul version the aventura ul which is a part 103 compliant uh seaplane and a lot of people end up with options taking it out of that category and putting an end number on there and just flying it as a ul some of the subtle differences are going to be uh the wing length on the hp it's slightly longer different ribs uh, so it's a little faster it does have flaps uh not needed but it has them and of course the gear mechanism is just a little different in terms of how it retracts from the outside they still perform the same function but um it, it uses a retract bar so little different uh differences there the ul has a shorter stubbier wing a little bit fatter uh wing rib profile so it's a little slower and that limits the speed but it definitely has a high lift high high uh um, high drag capabilities so um the ul just seems to be a really popular option right now we've kind of gotten away from the hp uh it's really now the ul and then any options you want to add to the ul it just makes it easy for us from a manufacturing standpoint and performance wise, they're very comparable because you're not getting anywhere fast either way with an HP or a UL. So the UL tended to be the easier one for us to, to manufacture and, and the one that's been around for the longest. Yeah, it's cool to see that history kind of play out with, I mean, with all the companies, right? We were at mm -hmm. uh, totally, I don't know if you consider a competitor, but it was interesting to at the Stoll competition at um, in Gainesville. 
they had a couple Rans aircraft competing, and they had like an S six from nineteen ninety, and then a you know recently completed S twenty, which is basically like the next evolution of that line. And it was really interesting to see them kind of park next to each other and be like, oh, like I get I get how this happened. So I I think that's yeah. cool just to talk about with you guys too. Um, There's really only two Amphib companies that have been around for more than 25 years. I, and so with that, you know, as we've evolved, putting what we manufacture and sell today, like the Aventur, even the one I was doing the demo flight in just the other day that we have in our hangar, and you put that next to something that was produced, one of the Aventurs that was produced in 1998. Um, they're very similar structural wise, but I mean, it's night and day uh, in, in terms of, you know, the fit and finish, the interior, the, the way everything's done. Um, and, and just to build quality, in my opinion. So it, it's changed a lot over the years, and, and we're excited to be able to show that. So having older aircraft out there that we still support is awesome because a lot of times you get to see them side by side like you just described. The, I got to say, we're getting so many questions about the plane. Normally, we don't get this many questions about a plane. So you, something about everyone must really be into this uh, idea of like flying a seaplane. Uh, ask uh, away. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. So... Uh, a couple questions. Well, we were just talking about the gears, so this might be a simple one. Red Baron Modeling is asking, like, how do they actually go up? Is it a manual thing or is it an electric thing? Electric yeah, mechanism? great question. So to answer that real quickly, we offer both. Um, we have a Johnson bar in the center that will actuate it manually, or you can even upgrade. Everything's kind of a bolt-on and take-apart uh, scenario, so it's, it's like an erector set. So you can even upgrade if you bought the manual initially and you want to go to the electric. We offer a full electric kit. Uh, the electric gear is a series of two different motors. Um, our competitor uses one motor per gear leg. Uh, we found that one 2,000 pound motor, 2,000 pounds of force that is, um, is sufficient for what we do, putting the gear down in the water and as, as well as raising it. it. It works very well, so it's lightweight because we're only running one motor. And then we, we custom make a full wiring harness with the relays and everything all pre-wired for the customer. So if they buy it as a kit, they're not having to really worry about how all that works. So there's one switch on the dash, up and down, that raises and lowers your gear. And we have light indicator lights that will tell you you know, two for green being the gears down for grass landing, red for it's in transition, and then blue for water is how we have them labeled. And then, of course, if you run the glass cockpits, you can have auditory alarms with squat switches and all of that. Um, but the manual gear is also very simple, very lightweight, and easy to use. So we offer both. Is there a weight savings with the with the manual one, I guess, technically? Right oh, now? yeah. Yeah, about, about 18 pounds. <laughs> that's a couple... That's a couple uh couple gallons couple gallons yeah I, I know that's a common question but uh, like i mentioned before we we are the lightest uh well actually i take that back we're the, we're the second lightest amphib i would i would want to say from a kid perspective on the market and um we allow ourselves a little bit of room for those options and still get good performance so you know yes the, the manual is the lighter weight option though some questions about the wings uh i don't know if maybe i just don't have the right like the photos aren't maybe as detailed as folks are sure. hoping for but like so, if you could talk a little bit about like the wing structure i think you mentioned too that that maybe has changed with some of the um you were yeah, talking so about the, the wings are one of our stuff so the wings are, are one of our unique um aspects of the aircraft because they're very lightweight in the way we construct them which adds to the overall performance of the aircraft as well and, and being lightweight um so that that helps a lot so i don't know how how many uh, of your viewers are familiar with the air cam from uh, lockwood aviation uh twin engine a lot of those are on floats uh, dual rotax pusher crazy uh, yeah. climb capabilities uh we have the identical wing so air cam and us use the exact same wing they have a center section to allow for the two two engines to be mounted and then those wings will slide into the, into that center section and, and produce their their full like 36 foot wingspan. Uh, we're 30 feet and one inch just because we don't have that center section. It goes to a root tube. So our wings are covered in a Dacron um, sailcloth. It's a full round Dacron. And now that material can be, um, it's, it's pre-sewn. So it goes on like a sock and it can be heat shrunk. And then that eliminates the wrinkles because it only shrinks 2%. And then at that point, it can be painted or it can be clear coated if you want the color sewn in. Most of these aircraft that you see in the pictures, uh, these were all built from kits. Uh, these are all pre-sewn fabric. So basically, it's a it's the color of the fabric. And then they use a UV coating that they protect it with by spraying over. Um, in fact, that picture that's on the screen now is November Pop. I built that aircraft in 2013. Um, and I was using the, the four-ounce Dacron with the clear coat process. The newer ones 
Uh, like I said, we do full full paint jobs on them. So we even do the silver tone, the UV protect, and then we go ahead and, and paint um, whichever, you know, PPG, DuPont, or even Emron um, on top of that. And some of them are three-tone paint jobs, so they get quite quite extensive. Um, but yeah, it, it, from an aesthetic perspective with the paint jobs, you can't tell the difference between that and anything else. In fact, um, another Amphib, uh, the C-Max, they use a Dacron cloth as well. Uh, so it, it's a very common practice. A lot of aircraft use it. And then uh, aesthetically, you can't really tell the difference with the paint jobs. But very strong, lightweight material. Um, and that really gives us an advantage, I think, overall with, uh, with our competition, both in performance and price and uh, weight carrying capacity. We're going to keep going with the questions here. But I want to take a, a break from tech stuff to ask you just about, like, your personal flying adventures with it. Like, obviously, there's this picture of the, like, cove. It's, like, insane cove. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, like, what's what's the, like, what's the coolest adventure you've had? Let me find this picture here. Oh, uh, man. Well, so I, I've been doing this since 2010. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, the last decade's kind of a blur because I fly so much. Um, yeah, there's, there's places like that that you get to go to. It's surreal. Um, in fact, here locally, I fly up to uh, Silver Glen, which is it's a... Uh, off of lake george which is a, the second largest lake i believe in florida um and there's springs right off of that so we, we can land and go kind of close to that area anchor off and then go swimming in clear water with manatees i mean it's just cool accessibility that otherwise you'd have to get to on a boat which can take up to three hours um or you know drive over there which of course is no fun um <laughs> so it's just that much cooler to come in on an airplane we do a lot with salt water so i've flown down to the keys many times the keys is awesome because it's super transparent, uh, super shallow, which we don't draft, but a couple inches. So we can land, and you can even see in that picture, I mean, that's no problem. We can take off and land in that uh, with, with, with ease. So, I mean, personally, I've flown Aventurers all over the place. I've flown all up the eastern seaboard. I've uh, flown uh, as far west as Texas. I haven't gone out to California yet in one, but uh, I've, I've flown all over the place. And, of course, all around central, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, so southeastern um, United States. So it's just been a blast. I mean, there's so many different places up in, in fact, Alabama has some beautiful, beautiful waterways, Tennessee as well. So on the way to Oshkosh, I mean, there's just so many places we've left early before and gone and ventured into those areas. And, and it's just, it's gorgeous out there. Um, Gunnersville is actually one of the most beautiful spots for, for these types of airplanes. If you, if you want to be within the U S um, outside, as you can see in that picture, that's actually Puerto Rico. There's some beautiful places out there, island hopping, the Keys, like I mentioned before, just, just, I mean, really sky's the limit on that. I hate to use that kind of that <laughs> word, but <laughs> I mean, cause there's no limits, but yeah, it's, it's basically, you get it. it it's, it's wherever you want to go, it, it'll take you. No, I think one of the, the trips that I always thought would be cool would be to grab something like an Aventura or a, or an air cam is another great, you know, example. And like, from Wisconsin, like hit the Mississippi and just like take the Mississippi all the way south because you could just, it's like. Oh yeah, well we have actually uh, you know south. Speaking of south, we have uh we have planes in Panama, all around Central and South America, all the way down to Argentina. And, and one of our customers, he owns a small island, and there's eight of them in Argentina that they they all fly around this little island, and it's just i mean you, you talk about flying over some of the rainforest and the jungles and and getting to explore some of these remote remote areas it's just to me that's that's just awesome <laughs> yeah super su I, I mean I, we were talking before the show like my family was like a boating family right my dad always had a boat and before he uh he moved back up north uh for his his octogenarian years you know, we had like a deck boat and we had like a, you know, a 30 foot sailboat at one time. And now we have a pontoon boat because it's easier to get it. Like you can like wheel them in the wheelchair on it and stuff. But like we've always been on the water. And I think it's like that idea of like, well, how do you combine those two is pretty interesting to me. I feel like the boat or the plane to me would be easier to dock than a boat. I don't know why. I think it's just more comfortable in a plane now, but. I don't know. Yeah. Just, so, uh, well, I would, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have no it, idea, it, right? It, it, still, um, some of the, some of the disadvantages is, is obviously the plane will weather vane. I mean, so will boats, but the boats don't have wings, right? So the, the plane will weather vane a lot. Um, 
easier than a boat will. So what we end up having to do is carry a little bit of power to get that airflow over the control surfaces in the rear, um, which of course lends itself to going a little faster. So having a constant speed prop on there with the, with the beta function uh, really makes it easy. Um, so for, for sure. But the other aspect is we have sponsons. Um, that's one of the things about float planes that make it a little easier for your viewers to understand is float planes have a, have a really good ability to be able to be docked. Whereas amphibs, they, they tend to be more for beaching, driving up a boat ramp, um, even mooring, you know, a little bit offshore, but docks, it, it, they're just not really dock friendly. So, uh, and part of that is because we have the sponson that sticks down below to, to allow ourselves not to fall left or right when we're off of a step, whereas the float plane is divided by two and spread apart. So that, that helps the stability aspect. They don't need the sponsons. So um, yeah, driving up to a boat ramp or, or beaching or going through tight tight spots is not a really a big problem once you get comfortable with the plane. Um, it's but you know, windy day, you know, skill will will aid in that. Um, whereas if you're not skilled and it's windy, you might have some issues. But I'm sure it's the same with a boat. Um, my boat has two engines on it, and trying to back that up, the rudders are useless. So you have to really understand how to use the transmissions and reverse forward, neutral, reverse forward, neutral, and a combination between the two. Um, the airplane is easier <laughs> than that. Um, but yeah, docking is kind of, kind of always been a challenge for any amphib. Uh, maybe, I'll, uh, yeah, you just gotta practice, gotta take a class. Uh, out inside wants to know how smooth or rough can the water be for landing and takeoff? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so that's another thing. Floats can handle a little bit more chop and, and the reason for that is because, uh, they're, they're obviously your the planes up here. There's structure that goes down to them. There's also divided by two, uh, less surface area. And then the, the, all that energy gets absorbed before it gets to the cabin. Whereas in the amphibs, you're sitting in your pontoon. So you feel everything. Now, the aircraft, it can be kind of misleading because the aircraft can handle it. It's not a problem. Um, it's just whether your comfort level with your butt being in the seat uh, is like, oh, my God, what's happening? Because you're shaking and all that. I've landed in, you know, about two foot swells before an 18 knock winds um and i was to actually rescue somebody so the plane did no problem i mean it was just a little above what i would consider my comfort zone at the time but now knowing how it handled it beautifully uh, it wasn't an issue and and i mean not saying i would do that every day but if i had to do it again i wouldn't be anywhere near as as uh, nervous i'd probably be fairly confident um one of the things with choppy water is obviously uh Glassy water can be dangerous, but it, it does lend itself to being nice to land on. We can handle anywhere from six inches to a foot is probably what you would be realistically expecting as being the max. Um, anything more than that, it starts to really uh, require some skill. And, and part of that is, is of course, coming in with full flaps, slow as you can, and stalling it in so that it gets off a step as quick as possible so you're not beating it up. right? If you, if you think about a boat doing 50 miles an hour on step, Granted, that's the same concept. If there's white caps out there, you're probably not going to do that because your boat's just going to get beat to crap. It's the same with the aircraft. So we come in with full flaps. We bring it in. We, we hit the water. We take it off a step almost immediately, and then we're good to go. The Aventura is, is really neat because we have um, spray rails on each side. The way the hull is designed, it sits higher in the water because it's lighter weight, and we have a really good buoyancy um, displacement for the weight that we have. So we sit usually about three inches higher than our competition in the water. So most most of the time, anything a foot or less, it, water will never even come over the nose. So you can still take off from that just fine. Um, it, it's where it starts, when it starts to splash over the nose that it, it can get a little bit hairy in terms of you're taking off. Cause now of course you're going from being a boat to being on step and then having to fly. And one of the tricks there is of course, getting it on step and then immediately dumping the flaps, meaning putting flaps in, I should say, holding that switch down to get it to break the suction and get you up in the air quicker. I don't put in the flaps until I'm on a step, so it doesn't induce drag initially, but that just helps me break that suction from the center instead of pulling back on the stick and bearing that tail. Um, so yeah, there, there's techniques to it, but to answer the question, I would say six inches to a foot would be realistic if you're getting into it and starting, but I've gone into two feet and the, and the aircraft has handled it just fine. And how much of that is the, we've got the wave height and then we also, you know what, uh, I'm learning about this stuff because my brother is uh, doing a lot of sailing now, and we went out on a, uh, I shouldn't admit this when we were talking about seaplanes, but on a sailboat, and for some reason, I've, I've never gotten uh, motion sick in a, in a plane, well, other than going upside down and like acro stuff, uh, and I've never really had a problem in boats, but like in this sailboat recently, we had like 
one foot kind of choppy stuff and i was just like ready to yak it he was talking to me about like oh like don't just concentrate on like the height also kind of i don't know what it's called in in boating is it the period the whatever the distance between the like can you have like two foot if the swells are really far apart and they're like three foot is that okay because you can just like zip over it i don't know yeah, that, that's that a good question. Um, so boat wakes uh, can be somewhat dangerous <laughs> if you're not cognizant of that, right? So, I mean, think of it like speed bumps. So if you're landing on that, you know, it could toss you back up in the air and then you don't have enough speed or energy to, con- to continue to fly. It's going to drop back down. It's like hitting a sure. hitting a, a wave when you're on step, right? It's going to launch the boat and then you're going to bam, smash back down into the water. So we, we kind of want to prevent that uh, for the most part. But um, swells, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, that's tough. It, it's the same concept. It's, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of a six inches to one foot. Swells are fine. Uh, we consider that the same as, as pretty much chop or landing on chop. Um, to answer that, I'm a, I'm a terrible boater when it comes to the terminology. To, to, to go back to what you were saying, I'm more, I would consider myself in this aspect more of a pilot <laughs> than a boater. But, um, you know, there's never been an issue from motion sickness standpoint. And that's just simply because you're so focused and concentrated on flying the airplane that I don't think you have time for that. Um, we Once you're off of a step and you're just being a boat, I mean, it really doesn't rock very that very much just because we do have the sponsor out there. It's, it's leaned over a little bit to one side. So the boat's fairly stable um, as an airplane or a boat um, in that regard. So, yeah, I mean, it, I guess to answer your question with the with the swells, uh, we treat them just like we do the waves. You know, the white caps, it, it's six inches to a foot would be considered safe. Anything more than that, you're, you're starting to put yourself into uh, a possibly dangerous situation if you if you're not if you don't if you're not that experienced, you know what you're doing. Sure. Yeah. And for, I'm and I'm I'm just curious about this stuff okay other uh oh we're almost out of time uh other things people want to be asking you i've been asked this a lot waukesha <laughs> pilot i see you i see that you want me to ask this um he wants to know about how do you like what's a pre-flight obviously you, you can pre-flight it on the ground right and then like put it in the water but if you had to mm-hmm. pre-flight it in the water like what's that experience like i assume you get wet a little bit. Oh yeah, I mean, most of the time, <laughs> you, you don't really buy a seaplane unless you plan to get wet. If, if you're one of those guys who who wear you know like Louis Vuitton shoes and want the leather and all that, and a more of a yacht kind of guy, I probably wouldn't get into these small light sports seaplanes. I'd buy like a you know a, a Caravan 206 on floats. <laughs> but um, with with these, yeah, you, you, you get in the water, but it, that's part of the fun, right? So you, you just, if you have a beach, you just walk around it. You know, it, it's usually a foot, two foot, maybe tops. It comes up to my kneecaps. So I'm wearing shorts, whatever. I have water socks in the plane that I keep in there. Um, or if, if you wear flip flops, I wear shoes a lot of times. I'm not a flip flop kind of guy. That's why I keep the water socks so I can just easily switch over. Um, but yeah, you just you do a quick walk around. The other thing, the, the aircraft's so simple, uh, realistically, especially if you built it yourself. Um, there's not a lot that that goes wrong. I mean, I don't want to say that you know, uh, I guess liberally, but um, there there really isn't. It's a very simple design, simple aircraft. So a lot of the stuff can be seen, you know, without having to do a really close up inspection of anything. It, it's all a lot of our engines are uncalled. Um, we do that on purpose, and that's part of the, being able to pre-flight it. You can actually stand up and uh, get on top, stand right on the ledger where the door is, um, and get on top of the wing to be able to see back there and then inspect the entire engine. All of that is is easily – now, you can't walk on top of the wing, obviously, but you can easily step up onto the side. It's hard to hard to see in the picture there where I'm describing. But just in front of the gear where the door entry is, that ledge right there you can stand on. Yep, there it is right right there in that picture. That you can stand on. You can view the top of your engine, the radiator, everything. And uh, makes it easy for pre-flight, really. And then, of course, the wings and everything, it rotates very simple in the water. So you can spin that aircraft 360 degrees if you're really – you know, got uh, a phobia of water, you can stand on the shore and turn the airplane uh, all the way around without with just one person and almost one handed uh, with no problem to be able to see 360. So walk arounds aren't that difficult. And of course, the gear's already out of the water. So you can see your brakes and your wheels even while you're flying. Is it called a swim around? Instead of I a guess you around? could call it that. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying okay. to avoid being cheesy, but yeah, okay, y'all will go with that. <laughs> Okay, a few more questions before we wrap it up for the night. Uh, this is awesome. so many people so interested in this in your aircraft here. Uh, people are wondering about the complete kit, like cost and build average, like build time. 
Yeah, no, that that's uh, also uh, obviously a great question. So we have the lowest build time in the industry, and, and the reason for that is because I'm not, I can't stress this enough. It, it's literally like an erector set. If you've played with Legos, if you put anything together, everything comes pre-bent, pre-drilled, and pre-cut. So you're basically, there's a few bolts that you put in holes, but there's no real riveting that goes on. There's like two rivets, I think, or four rivets in the entire kit that you have to actually rivet yourself. Um, everything else is, is pre-made. You're just bolting it together like an erector set. So a um, couple of holes you have to drill, but the, the list of tools we have is actually half a page. Um, so, and it's very basic tools. Like you're talking stuff you can pick up at Harbor Freight um, and, and not have any problem building this airplane. So the build time for us is 250 to 300 hours um to to complete the aircraft so a lot of people end up tending to take about somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 if they want to do the full-blown custom paint jobs and go all out you know but a, every kit that we've sold in the last two years um so far has been under 400 hours so we've been pretty fortunate there um the other side of that is cost uh as everybody knows i mean it's crazy where where it was cost wise in 1995 to where it is now things change crazy amounts have gone up inflation everything else material anodizing you name it everything's gone up in price so our kit is still the most cost effective on the market we're at 49.5 so just under 50,000 for the complete kit and that gives you an entire airplane in a box uh, that does not include the engine or the avionics so you get to choose whichever engine you want and whatever you want to put in the panel and we have some cost effective recommendations that we have for customers if, the, if price is there is their concern we can keep the entire kit under $75,000 um, and that's a complete, like I said, uh, everything you need to build an airplane in a box. So that's a very cost effective when you think of a brand new airplane that can land on water. Yeah, that's, I mean, honestly, that's also, if I'm not mistaken, like competitive across all aircraft that can't land on water, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. There's, like, there's I mean, not a lot of, air, I mean, it's definitely like uh, you're trading some of, the, I, I imagine, the trade-off a little bit is like you're trading the ability to land on water for some speed in that same price range potentially but like sure. it's still like for a for a kit built aircraft if i'm not i'm not like brian wallstrom like i don't know i don't know all this stuff like off the top of my head but if i'm not mistaken it's pretty there's not a lot of airplanes home built airplanes in that price range no, I mean, most of them, especially with the glass cockpits that the people offer nowadays, I mean, it gets quite, it can get quite expensive. It's not uncommon, even for light sport. I know people balk at the price all the time, but to find a light sport, you know, um, there, there are a lot of options under 250K, but it really gets narrowed down the window when you talk about being able to finish your airplane and fly it for under 100K, you, you start to, it gets tighter and tighter. Um, unless you want like something like a backyard flyer, especially like you mentioned, trading off speed for, for landing on the water, you're not going to get a lot of speed either for under hundred K and plus the light sport is limited to 120 knots anyway. So if you're doing this to go someplace fast, it's cheaper to probably fly one of the budget airlines. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, a lot of people saying that I should put an order in the joke on the show is that whatever guest I have on the show that week is what I spend the next week Googling. Uh, and so everyone's like, they all know this now. So they're like, oh, get that order in. Chelsea says, right, I'm cowboy, let's do it. Um, and then 72 Papa mentions, uh, as a reinforcing just what you just said, uh, you can easily spend $75,000 on just a panel. No, oh, yeah, no, that's that's so, true. I have not got there yet. Um, I have spent the most expensive panel. I think we we've done is probably I'm in a Garmin dealer, so I guess I, I'm kind of cheating because I do get a better pricing. But um, is about ten thousand dollars that we've we've done a panel, and that was a full Garmin G3X. Uh, it was almost up until IFR. Uh, with that, with the exception of we didn't add the secondary navigator. So, but it, it, with the secondary navigator, it would have cost us probably around thirteen thousand all in. Um, and that's remote com, remote transponder, Garmin G3X, uh, uh, even with an iPad, iPad mount, uh, full switches, everything, you name it, everything we threw in the panel. And it was a laser cut custom carbon panel that we offer now as well. So, yeah, it, it's tough to get to the 75 grand in, in our world, but um, uh, on panel. But, yes, I, I can totally relate because avionics can get you can go all out if you want to. You just need to bring, uh, instead of all that stuff, just bring, like, both the paper sectional and, like, those cool boat sectionals that are all, like, rubbery. 
Well, you'd be surprised. I mean, a lot of our customers nowadays with iPads, what you can do with those. I mean, there's products like Wingbug out there that, that give you a self-encompassed speedo static system. There's ForeFlight. You know, there's a Flight Aware. There's all these different apps that provide navigation and flying information um, all to a to a tablet. So, I mean, you can get away with actually being very cost effective on on what you run in your panel. I mean, you can really you can really go. I don't want to say cheap uh, because it's really not cheap it, it, it's good quality stuff right they're apple products and, and everything but um they're just from compared to what a lot of people are running it, it is a very cost effective option last question and then we're going to play a quick game before i cut you loose because i know it's getting late on the east coast um folks are asking about trailering and wings and are they like foldable and or removable yeah, so that's one of the most common questions we get is, do we have folding wings? And and the answer to that is uh, no. <laughs> um, the reason for that, though, is because our wings are so easily removable. It's literally five bolts that hold our wing on to be able to remove it. Uh, it does take two people just because of the bulkiness of it. Um, one of our employees, Larry, actually removed it by himself just to prove it could be done, but I don't recommend this to a lot of people. Uh, it, it, two people, wing comes off in less than 20 minutes, So and that's both sides. So you can have the plane. In fact, uh, two years ago in 2019, when we, we trailered one of our aircraft to Oshkosh, so back to the trailer, yes, it can be trailered, no problem. We trailered one of our aircraft to Oshkosh, and from the time we actually did a, a flight before we, we put it in the trailer and we landed, we had it from flying condition to in the trailer and ready to hit the road in one hour. Um, and that was loaded and, and, like I said, a long trip to, to Wisconsin. So that was, uh, you know, bungees and, and straps and, and pool noodles and you name it. So one hour to have the aircraft from flying condition to being in a trailer ready to road, hit the road. Muted. I, uh, here I am. I'm back. I was muted because I was saying thank you to Chelsea because she's signing off. And she was saying that she's got a plane to fix tomorrow and that you are an awesome guest. Thanks, no, Chelsea. No, thank you. All right, uh, so I was typing and I hit the mute button and you know it's a very professional operation over here. Uh, <laughs> we gotta play a game real quick before I let you go. So this, the game is, and I hope you're on board, uh, it's called Short Final. And we just put a minute on, he's getting warmed up. Uh, we just <laughs> put a minute on the clock. I'm just gonna ask you a bunch of random airplane questions, short answers, uh -oh. and we'll just see. Well, it's a oh, little late at night for that. <laughs> no, no, it's not going to be like, I'm not going to ask you like what color the taxiway lights are or anything. It's not a quiz. Oh, Although James good, did ask good. one I was wondering about where, the fuel. Where's the fuel in the plane? Ah, good question. Place? Yeah, we don't we don't use fuel. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it, goes, <laughs> it goes behind the seats um, under the luggage deck. Uh, so it's actually built into the airframe. There's a there's a 23 gallon tank that we can run back there, a 12 gallon tank. And we used to offer an 18 gallon tank, but we no longer do. So it's 12 to 23 depending what you want. Um, and that is behind the bulkhead under the luggage deck. So it, if it's you want to like look low, at it, the like back and low. where yeah, the gear me... is, it's, it's just behind that. So, so, it'd be, uh, so yeah, it's true. basically where the camera is that took this picture. It's directly to uh, the right of it. <laughs> you find it. It's 100 it inches from the, from the nose, which is our datum. So that's, I know this from weight and balance. <laughs> So it's station 100. I'm trying to, so it's kind of like, I wish I could. You see that, um, you see the rear window? Well, yeah, it's kind of yeah, like Yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. The rear window where it's kind of like a triangle and it's pointing down, right under there is the fuel tank. Oh, rock on. Okay, cool. All right, and back to short final. If anybody has any questions, can email me or even chat on our website, um, and I'll be more than happy to send pictures. Well, real, since you brought it up, let's do the let's do that Like before we play our little game here. Uh, where should people come learn more about you guys? Uh, so we have a website, www.c-plane, but that's spelled out. So it's S-E-A hyphen P-L-A-N-E dot com. Um, and, and that is quite a bit of information on there. The easiest way to get a hold of us is a contact us form right on the website, but it, it goes to, to my email, which is alexr at c-plane dot com. And then we also have a chat feature now on the website, so they can just hit me up anytime. It goes right to my cell phone, and I can respond with you know any any type of uh, pictures, questions, et cetera, that they may have. That's awesome. Okay, short final. Here we go. I'm uh, gonna put some cool music on. Boom. Get the timer going. Alex Rolinski from uh, Aero Adventure. First of all, coolest airport you've ever landed at. Ooh, I'd probably say uh, Jekyll Island. I love Jekyll Island. <laughs> what about the, what about the coolest seaplane base or coolest place you've landed? Just the plane. 
Oof. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say the keys. Yep, marathon. Rock on. What about your favorite passenger you've ever had in the in an airplane? Ooh, that's that's a real tough one. I've carried a lot of a lot of celebrities too. Um, shoot, I'd probably say. Well, you know what? I I can't. Her name does not come to mind. <laughs> but uh, she she's actually a pilot. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. But she's uh, Jessica. Jessica Cox. There we go. That was oh, that was. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I flew with Jessica Cox in the Aventura, and we actually hit a gator. I probably shouldn't what? say that on a live, yeah, a live stream, but we accidentally uh, hit a gator on uh, on landing. It, it didn't move. I guess it was sleeping or whatnot, and we we bumped it. And uh, of course, it was fine. It, it didn't hurt the gator at all, or the airplane for that matter, because we we're on a step. But that was the coolest, <laughs> probably the coolest. Uh, thing that happened during a flight with uh, somebody famous that's that's awesome and then the one that everyone's getting mad if i don't ask you is track up or north up on your gps oh. uh, i say track up there you go you just started like a five-month internet war i don't know not really. yeah i know right now like uh oh <laughs> i think i'm a tra- i think i'm a track up person no it depends if it's like I, on the gps for me is north up mostly because I can't remember how to switch it all the time. Cause I don't, I'm more of a map <laughs> guy. But then, like always, like on four flight, like north up makes yeah. sense to me. I think I'm. But then I, I mean, maybe I probably that's probably dangerous. I probably get confused. Well, honestly, it's, it's whatever. I, if I have to mess with it too much, I probably just deal with it. So it, it's whatever it is at the time, depending on the equipment I'm using. Because I fly so many different airplanes, so it's, it's irrelevant. <laughs> People get very passionate about this, although no one is. Uh, no one's upset with you about that answer in the chat. Anyway, All right. Alex, dude, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. It's so good. I hope I hope we can. Uh, oh, maybe it's one of these days I'll get back down to Florida and I'll, I'll come knock on your door. Yeah, definitely. We should do a flight, and everybody's welcome to come over. Well, I mean, we do demos all the time, so um, we fly. I'm just, I, I don't want to use the word whore, but I'm a seaplane whore, so I guess, <laughs> or seaplane aficionado. <laughs> so if you want to come down, I mean, I'm all about jumping in the plane and going for a ride. So thank you for rad. having me on the show. Dude, yeah, thank you again so much for being on. Everybody else, thank you so much for watching. Go check them out online. Check out the plane. And uh, make sure to tune in next week for more airplane stuff. And, oh, I got to remember, like, you know, the like button, the share button, the, all that stuff. Subscribe. That's a thing, too. Um, and I'm doing, like, TikToks now. I'm trying to be hip and cool. So I'm on, like, TikTok. You doing TikTok, Alex? You doing any TikToks? Uh, I don't have. My daughter has TikTok. But, uh, yeah, I don't I do not do TikTok. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not to sure figure it works. out. Makes me feel yeah. super old. Anyway, yeah, I still got analog gauges in my plane, so you know, <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, everyone, we will see you next week. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll uh, we'll see you in Super Air Live.